Congregation, would you please be seated? Children, would you come forward for the kids' sermon? Pastor Steve is going to join us today. Come on up. I would love to chat with you for a minute. Nice to see you. Any other little kids of any age? Yeah, here we go. All right, friends. Thanks for making the long walk up here. Great to see you all. Hey, I'm going to uh, just ask you, a, I think, a pretty simple question. Kind of reminds me of when I was a kid. Uh, here's my question. You guys can answer too if you want. Have your parents, oh, nice to see you. Thanks for coming up. Hey, have your parents ever told you to do anything at all? Have your parents ever told you to do anything? Yes, okay. You should know. Yeah, they all admitted yes. Okay. Um, have you always done everything exactly that your parents told you to do? No, they're all agreeing. You can, okay, no, no, we haven't. Um, your parents also, they've not only told you to do things, your parents also love you very much. In fact, they kind of go together. Sometimes they tell you to do things because they love you. They've also promised some things. Your parents have promised to take care of you, be there for you, feed you, keep you safe. Now, you don't have to raise your hands on this one, but I'm just going to you just think, okay? What if I don't always do what my parents tell me to do? Will they still do what they promised to do? Will they still give me breakfast and lunch and dinner and drive me around and keep me safe even if I don't pick up my toys? Yeah, of course they will, right? Because they promised to, and they're going to keep their promises, okay? You're going to hear something from the Bible in just a second, and it might sound a little hard to understand, but I want you to understand it this way. When we hear the Bible in a second, it's going to say, is the law of God opposed to? Is it against the promises of God? No, God tells us to do stuff, teaches us because he loves us and he wants good things for us. He's also promised to love us and forgive us and save us. And even when we don't do the things that God tells us to do, God still keeps God's promises because he loves us always and it never stops. Does that make sense to you? You know God loves you? Yeah, I thought so. All right, let me pray for us and you go back and sit with your parents again. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us, caring about us, teaching us how to live, forgiving us when we don't. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, you guys can return to your seats and we're going to continue with our Bible reading. Today's reading is from Galatians chapter 3. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Great to be here with you this morning. If we haven't met before, uh, my name is Steve. I'm one of your pastors here at UALC and glad for the chance to be 
in worship with you today. Uh, I know if I'd called all the adults up for the kids' sermon, we would say, oh no, we've always done everything perfectly. Just the kids who haven't, right? No, it's, it's going to be good news for us too. Hey, we're, at the, we're in the last week of a series that we've been uh, together in for about six weeks now. Uh, if you still have your journal with you, you might want to open it up. It's called the Free Series. We've been hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ setting us free, particularly in our relationship with our money, our stuff, our wealth, as part of our relationship with God. We've heard a lot of different things over the course of this series. We're going to have a chance to look back on some of those and ask kind of how they hold together and a chance to pray together for how God might be speaking to each of us, kind of how we're taking any of this home. We've heard things over the course of this series that might even be hard to know how to hold together. We've heard some teachings from Jesus. We've heard some commands from Jesus. We've heard some challenges from Jesus. We've heard also words of forgiveness and comfort and liberation. We might be asking ourselves, how do the teaching and the commands go with the freedom and the forgiveness and the liberation? And of all of those things, what am I taking out of this? What's kind of my walk away, take away from this series? Uh, Let me just give you a few ideas, and I'm going to take you way back to before the beginning of this series, about, I don't know, a few weeks or a month before we started, we had an all-staff meeting, and I wanted to tell the staff what to expect in this series, help them understand what we were about to do. So I gave them a few questions to reflect on. I'm just going to tell you the same questions that I shared in our staff meeting. The first question was this, what, according to the Bible, is the right amount of money for a Christian to have in savings? What's the right amount? I asked them, uh, but those are questions that we, there's not a clear answer to that. There's not a verse uh, on that. Uh, but they are questions that we have, answers that we would like to know as followers of Jesus. Uh, the next question I asked them was, uh, what's the right amount for me uh, as a Christian to spend on the next car that I buy? What's the right amount for that? Uh, it could depend on a lot of things. And it doesn't, I don't mean to say that there isn't an answer to that question. It's just that there's not chapter and verse on that question. We are going to seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit Uh, and try to be faithful followers of Jesus. And then the question I didn't ask them that I probably should have and I will ask you is, what about when I get that wrong? (laughs) What does that mean? Uh, When I have gotten it wrong uh, and when I inevitably get that wrong again. What does God's word have to say to me about these and many other decisions that we have to make uh, all the time, multiple times every day? We have to make decisions like this. Well, I want to sum up some things and kind of share with you what has been the logic, if you will, what has been the thinking behind and underneath every week uh, of this series. And it assumes that God, by his word, is always doing these two things in each of our lives for us to hear and respond to. God is always teaching us, and God is also always saving us. He's teaching us and saving us. If you have any history with the Lutheran family of Christians over the years, and I know that a lot of us do, this is what's traditionally called law and gospel. And I'm going to explain this a little bit more in a moment. God is always teaching us. Let me explain. That's a big category. It's one thing that God does. God teaches us. And you could understand a lot of things under that category of teaching. And I'm going to, I'll go, I'll, this, I'll go through this list a little bit and give some examples. God trains us, challenges us, commands us, etc. In this series, we have been hearing God training our minds and our thoughts in lots of different ways. In fact, in our journal, we printed the three passages that we've kind of been going back to over and over again through the series. And Jesus, in his word, uh, has been giving us various thoughts by which to train us. He asks us questions sometimes. Why do you worry about clothes as one example? Well, we might actually be able to answer that question. I, I have lots of reasons I worry about these things. He also gives us commands, don't worry about, what, about your life, what you will eat or drink. Stop worrying. So therefore, did all of you instantly stop worrying every time you heard that, right? No, a lot of us continue to worry. There are other uh, uh, teachings in these passages. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. That's kind of a teaching that's meant to like jar us a little bit because we might go like, oh, I, no, that's actually a good point because I kind of act like it does. Or there's warnings. In the third reading from 1 Timothy, this passage warns us, The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That's a phrase that has kind of come back to me over and over again uh, in this series. Am I making choices, the the fruit of which are to pierce myself with many griefs? Am I kind of choosing grief and headache and anxiety and worry and trouble 
in one way or another. These are uh, passages by which God teaches and trains us. He also challenges us in this. Because when we hear these things, these are, this isn't just neutral information, right? This comes to us with a challenge. And you remember in this, over the course of the series, uh, Pastor Aaron and Joe and I have come back a few times to this idea that money is attached to different emotions. We're getting challenged at a deeper level. Some of us are chasing security. Some of us are chasing acceptance or love or popularity or belonging or status. Some of us are chasing happiness or dopamine or pleasure. Some of us are chasing other things. What is it that makes me resistant to the wisdom and training and teaching of God? We're getting down underneath. We talked about the work of sin operating in our hearts and driving us toward these things, helping us to believe empty promises rather than God's promises. When, when God teaches us, he trains us, he challenges us, and these things aren't just like optional suggestions. God's like, hey, I think it would be cool if you were uh, open-handed, faithful, and generous with your stuff, but if not, no biggie. The, as someone once said about the Ten Commandments, these aren't the Ten Suggestions. God's not kidding around. Like, he wants this for us. He wants this for his world. He commands this to us. God is our King and our Lord. He says, this is how I am commanding you to live together with one another. And when we hear that, we are also exposed. We are convicted. We are judged, if I get ahead of myself. Because I hear these commands and these warnings and these teachings, and I go like, oh, that's actually not how I'm living. That's not how I have lived. It's not how I'm living now. And I admit that I want to. It, it provokes the Holy Spirit in me. I go, that's the right way to live. And then half an hour later, I'm choosing something else. Continue to sin. And in this, there is God by, teaches us, he commands us, he exposes us, and judges and condemns sin in us. Someone I went to graduate school with, I just happened to see a post of theirs on Facebook yesterday, the day before. Uh, this person said, uh, when someone hurts my children, I, am, I come to understand why God's wrath is a contingent expression of his love. <laughs> no, that's theological language, I know. But God doesn't take the sin and disobedience in our lives lightly because it actually hurts other people. It breaks the way we live together. It's a real serious thing. And God judges and condemns sin in us. God's word is always teaching us. Now, God's wisdom is good. God's instructions are good. Some places in the Bible says God's law is holy, just, and good. But if that's all we had, we probably wouldn't say, good. We need another word from God. God's word also saves us. God's word saves us. And that's a big category also. The good news of God, the announcement, the gospel of God, the announcement of the good news of God's action for us in Jesus Christ saves us, and it does that also a number of ways. By God's word, he forgives us. You, you can't read the story of Jesus in the scriptures and come to the conclusion that people finally got it figured out, and therefore Jesus came. No way. That's never happened in your life. That's never happened in my life. God came to us while we were yet sinners and reconciled us to himself. God came to us while we were yet enemies of God, opposed to God, and yet came and made friends and made peace with us. God comes to us in forgiveness, offers us forgiveness for our sins when we are exposed and show that we inevitably sin. And God doesn't say, oh, hey, that's okay, no big deal. Right? It actually is a big deal. That's why it's called forgiveness and not just, I don't know, permission or something. When our kids were pretty young, we weren't always very good at this. We failed at this, too. <laughs> but we tried to, when our kids sort of offended against one another or disobeyed us or something, we tried very often not to say, oh, that's okay. We tried to teach them to say, and say, I forgive you. Because <laughs> something actually happened here, and yet our relationship is restored. God forgives us. God adopts us. This is a word we don't, it's just, this is a New Testament word. It's a biblical word. We don't, get, we don't read that passage as often. We don't hear this as often. But God claims us as his own children. He applies to us the word that was spoken to Jesus. You are my beloved child. You're my beloved son or daughter. With you, I am well pleased. For Jesus' sake, because of the forgiveness of sins, I call you a member of my family. You don't have to chase belonging anywhere else. You don't have to chase acceptance or love anywhere else. You have received love from God in heaven. God adopts us into his family. God, by means of his word, liberates us and empowers us. And he liberates us on the one hand, maybe simply 
by truth, by telling us the truth about where life is found. These kind of things that we chase, we've talked about chasing security, chasing acceptance, or chasing happiness, or dopamine hits, or whatever. God's word will tell us those are actually mirages. Those are empty promises. You can't guard against every risk. Anything you do that earns the acceptance of others can also be unearned. That's an empty promise of love and community. The real joy that we seek in life comes in a relationship with God and life among his people. The passage from 1 Timothy that we read a couple weeks ago said that God has provided all things for our enjoyment. God's not anti-joy. He's just anti-us chasing short-term joy that never satisfies. He liberates us by truth and also by the outpouring, by the gift of his living spirit, by his Holy Spirit coming into our lives and breaking the spiritual bondage that we have, the addiction to sin that we have to set us free and give us new life and to give us new power, to empower us, to give us power that does not come from us. And this is why none of our sermons here, I hope, ever are reducible to, hey, you guys, do better, right? Because we know that's not enough. We know that left to our own devices, we'll keep wandering away from God. But we turn back to the forgiveness of God and to the gift of God, which is his Holy Spirit, which creates new life in us, which does something in us which we can never do ourselves. The, the Bible takes this new freedom, this new life, this new power so seriously that it's usually described in terms of death and life, that we are dying with Christ and being raised up to new life in him. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, if you're at all a Bible memorizer, if you ever learn any verses, these are two that would be worth it. Uh, Galatians 2.20 and the next one comes from Romans 6. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have shared spiritually in the crucifixion of Christ. An old me has been put to death. A new me is created sharing life together in Christ. Or the same truth said a little bit differently in Romans chapter 6. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Some of you, if you've attended funerals at UALC or many other churches, we read this. And we read this because it says the death that we experience now has already been preceded by dying spiritually with Christ. So the life we anticipate has already begun. We share life with Christ in the future because we share it already now. We've already been baptized into Christ Jesus. We were baptized into his death. We were, therefore, buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. In the New Testament, there are kind of two word families that both of them oftentimes get translated, as you see at the bottom, live a new life. One of those word families just means to be alive, like to have a heartbeat and breathe and be a living creature. The other one of those word families is a word picture that means to walk, like to, to carry out your life. It's about the manner of life. We not only uh, talk the talk or live the life, but we also walk the walk. And this is that other word family. Some translations of Romans 6, 4 say that so that we too may walk in the newness of life. This is the gift of God's Holy Spirit being given to us. So what do we do when we hear all these different words of God spoken to us, training us, teaching us, challenging us, commanding us, forgiving us, adopting us and welcoming us, liberating us and empowering us? We just listen to them both. We hear both God's law and God's gospel, God's teaching and God's saving. And we ask, with, the ears open, with ears open by the Holy Spirit of God, what, what needs to be corrected in me? What lie am I believing? Where am I chasing life where it can't be found? What is still sin in me that needs to die? What needs to go away? There's a verse in the book of Hebrews that said, describes the sin that so easily entangles. Like, where am I still stepping in sin? And, and then, hear God's word of forgiveness to us his promise to us, which is not conditional on us getting it all right. It's God's promise to us to forgive us these sins and to call us his own anyway and to lead us to walk in the newness of life, to live in the freedom that comes in relationship with God and not the bondage that comes from believing empty promises. We listen to both of these words in the gift of God's Holy Spirit. So I want to close today by giving us a chance to do that. I'm just going to 
point out these three kinds of freedom that are introduced at the very beginning of your series journal, as a matter of fact. And I'm going to lead us in maybe a half a minute or a minute of prayer on each of these three kinds of freedom. So I want to invite you to reflect and listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you. When I ask those opening questions at the very beginning uh, of the sermon, I don't know if you notice this or not, but in each case I asked, uh, what's the right amount of savings or buy a car or whatever for me as a Christian, I said each time. Because there's always the example of Jesus. There's always God's teaching for us together as followers of Jesus. And there's God's Holy Spirit speaking to each of our individual circumstances through these things. How is God speaking to you as a Christian to give you internal freedom in your soul? To give you freedom from the guilt and the shame that you feel because of whatever money, wealth, possession, or honestly, whatever else. Whatever other way you've stepped in it and gotten tangled up and messed up and disobeyed God. Where do you need to hear the freedom of God saying, I know, and I forgive you, and I love you, and you are mine, and this does not define me. And where do you need to hear the word of God speaking freedom from? Like what empty promises are you still believing? What, what life-sucking patterns are you stuck in that you can say, Holy Spirit, teach me truth instead. I don't want to keep doing things that hurt me and other people. Set me free. And we can ask, what is the Holy Spirit setting you free for? To keep in step with the Spirit, to march to the drum of the Holy Spirit, to do good, set free for good forever and for participation with God now. I'm going to lead us in just a couple minutes of prayer here on these topics, and you can pray silently along, listening to and praying along with the Holy Spirit in your life. Let me lead us in some prayer. God, we come before you as sinful people in need of your forgiveness and grace and freedom. Please speak words of freedom to our hearts, to our souls, to our minds. Free us from guilt and shame and worry. Lord Jesus, as you have triumphed over death itself, as you have conquered the enemy, would you conquer the enemy in us? Set us free from the lies we believe, from the patterns that we're stuck in. Make us deaf to the voice of the tempter and attuned to your voice in our lives. Holy Spirit, what would you say to each of our hearts and to us together, the people? What are you setting us free for? What life that is truly life? What steps of action and obedience do you have for me, for each of us, to keep in step with you? pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. This is the last week of the series. It's probably not the last week of most of our lives. Not the last week of our life in relationship with Jesus forever. I encourage you to continue to seek the forgiving, liberating, empowering, teaching work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you haven't used the prayer and reflection questions that are in the series journal yet, I commend those to your use to continue to receive the grace and power of Jesus for you. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn together. Mm -hmm.